The first consideration in this subject, of course, has to be, is there a God? Does he exist? Uh, and it seems to me that wherever you look in nature, uh, whatever area of the earth that you look at, whatever consideration you give to the movements of the heavens, that there's one word that just keeps coming forward all the time, and that is design, design, design. And if there's a design, then there must be someone who's designed it. And that's the view that we have as Christadelphians, that man hasn't done it, but God has done it. He has designed the world in which we live. He has created it. Now, if you want to turn a blind eye to that, then that's, that's your choice. And believe that it's all occurred by chance. And I put it to you that if you do that, then you are in a situation whereby it would take a staggering amount of additional faith to believe in that type of concept. To believe in a theoretical model without any scientific foundation. It's much easier to believe that there is a God. And if that's the case, then we really need to take into account what God has said. And he's graciously given us a book whereby we can look at what he says, what he wants, what he tells us about himself, about his world, and we can seek to ignore it if we want to or seek to live by it. And what we hope to do this evening is to show you that the way the world is going is a way which God does not want. And it's a way in which the nations are actually preparing themselves for a state of judgment which God says he will bring upon the earth. In fact, in the 17th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, which I'm not going to ask you to turn to, it tells us that God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world by that man whom he hath ordained. And it goes on to say, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. And he's speaking about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ who was the son of God and who lived his life on this earth without committing anything that is untoward, without committing any sin, and died the death of crucifixion. But God raised him from the dead. And he now sits at the right hand of God, awaiting that time to return to the earth to execute God's judgments upon the earth. So it is God's view that we really want to put forward tonight. And I would perhaps ask you to turn to maybe our first reference, which is in the Acts of the Apostles and chapter 5. This is the, the line that we really have to accept as a, as a precursor to, to looking at, at this particular topic. And it's in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. The Lord Jesus Christ has not long been resurrected and has gone to heaven. And when... The preaching about his resurrection caused such a, a rumpus in Jerusalem so that some of the preachers, the disciples, former disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, were put into prison. And they brought them out of prison and said, you can be released now, but don't speak any more of this, this matter. And, and Peter said, verse 29, and the other apostles, so it was Peter and the other apostles, answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. And that's the basis upon which we're going to have a look at morality, because that's what it's all about, isn't it? What is morality? The world will tell us about morality, but God tells us about morality also. And we say that we ought to obey God rather than men. We take the line that Peter took here. And we seek to understand what God has told us in his word. Now, a definition of morality is conformity to the rules of right conduct. And if we're going to obey God's view, then we're going to look at what God has decided is right and wrong. You can ask a man in the street to tell you what he thinks is right and wrong. You get all sorts of different answers, all sorts of, shade of dif shades of different opinions about what is right and what is wrong. But... But God has actually let us know in his word what's right and what's wrong. And for those who seek to understand that and to follow that, there is a great reward. 
a tremendous reward that is on offer in the Word of God. So I'd like us to turn now to the Old Testament, if, if you wouldn't mind going to the book of Leviticus, which is um, very, uh, maybe, not often used book, but one which contains a lot of good information for us. And in the book of Leviticus, I'd like to turn maybe to chapter 18. And to put Leviticus into its context, we need to understand what has happened. And what has happened is that the nation of Israel, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel had been taken previously down into Egypt, where they'd been for a few hundred years, and had been brought out, which uh, the Bible describes in the book of Exodus by plagues that God had brought upon the Egyptians. And they were in the wilderness. And they were about to enter into the land of promise. Now at this time in Israel's history, it was not evident, it was not known that they would continue to wander in a wilderness for 38 years because of disobedience. So looking at this real time, what we understand is that God was expecting them, or they were expecting, to go into the promised land almost immediately. And so Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 3, God through Moses gives them a solemn warning. You can see this in verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. And then this is the instruction. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, ye shall not do. So when they were in Egypt, they were in there for a very long time. The culture of the Egyptians became part of their culture. The worship of the Egyptian idols became part of their worship. And God brought them out from that that place because the Egyptians had made them slaves and they cried unto God and God delivered them from Egypt with a mighty hand and he is warning them he said well don't do what you used to do when you were in Egypt you've been brought into this place don't go back don't take a step backwards and be like you were and then he says and after the doings of the land of Canaan whither I bring you shall ye not do, neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. Now that's quite remarkable, isn't it? Because God was, had taken them out from Egypt, and now God was going to put them into a land where the practices, where the customs, where the culture was worse than the land of Egypt. And so he had to be sure that he would protect them from all these abominations. And so Leviticus chapter 18, which we won't look at, lists all sorts of abominable practices which God said his people should avoid. They would only, if they were faithful, have to avoid them for a short space of time because God was going to clear the land from all these abominations. But in the meantime, whilst that was taking place, God warned them that all of the practices of the nations of the land of Canaan they would not need, they should not get involved with all of those things. Well, that's all in the past, isn't it? That's all in the past. What about now? What about today? Well, in the New Testament, God has revealed his laws on morality, because Leviticus 18 deals with laws on morality, and God has revealed his laws on morality for this current age in which we live. And we say the Bible speaks about the various ages as we might call them dispensations. And, and the one that we're in now is the one which we can regard as the Christian age, if you like, because it gives us the laws that Christ set out and it takes us up to a time beyond our own day when he will return from the earth. And, and this is our guidebook. This is what we have to consider. So we want to look at what God says in the New Testament and put this to the test as to what, whether God thinks the same way as man thinks, whether there is any correlation between these two ideas, what man has said and what God has said. So we're going to look at a passage 
in the letter to the Colossians in chapter 3. Now, this particular one is on the screen. We don't really need to turn this one up. But what we're going to do is have a look at these verses and then break down a couple of, um, of uh, break down verse 5, try and understand what God wants us to consider. So, he's providing some exhortation through the inspired words of the Apostle Paul, who says in verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. What that verse is telling us is that our laws come from God. They come from above. And at the right hand of God at the moment is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so verse 2 goes on to say, set your affection on things above, not on things of God. So you seek the things which God said, and then you set your affection on them. You make them part of your life. And then he says, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. That's just a bit of a hint as to what this reward is on offer. That if we consider ourselves dead to the things of the world, but alive to the things of God, then when Christ does come, when he appears, he's, the, the, the verse 4 tells us, he shall also appear in glory. There is to be a, some promise that will be executed at that time. And so in order for this to happen, we need to follow the ways of God. And verse 5 gives us that. Verse 5 tells us to mortify, therefore, put to death your members which are upon the earth, things that you might ordinarily do. And then they're listed. They're not very nice things to consider, but they're there for our consideration. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. And so only the last one of all those things are, are really explained. We need to probably quickly explain each of these. So the first one is fornication. It's a Greek word called pornea, and it really refers to any form of sexual immorality, anything that is immoral. And it's God that decides that, and we're going to look at that in a minute. Uncleanness is the next one. And we look there, look at the definition of that or the meaning of that and it's profligate living. Well, anything goes, do whatever you like, not bothering what God has said. Inordinate affection is the third one in the list and we can understand that as unrestrained affection. Just do, again, whatever you like towards anyone you might love, whatever they might be. Uh, finally, no, not quite finally, fourthly, evil concupiscence, which we understand as a, a wicked lust, a form of lust which is wicked. Again, the definition comes from, from God. And finally, that one which is explained in the record, covetousness, which is explained there as idolatry. So when we move this forward now, what we want to do is to find out what else there is in the New Testament to guide us. So all of these things are to be not part of our lives. That record tells us in verse 5, mortify therefore or put to death. There's nothing in that list that should be part of our lives. We need to explore it a bit more, uh, in a bit more detail. So what about some other words that the New Testament teaches on marriage? Well, we're just going to look at two, two quotations. You can turn them up if you want to, but there's no real need. The first one is in Hebrews 13 and verse 4. In the letter to the Hebrews, we read this, that marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. So as far as morality is concerned, what we are to consider is, well, marriage, God says, is fine. That's fine for a man and woman to come together, and we'll see that's God's definition of marriage in a minute. He regards that as perfectly moral. It's not at all immoral. It's honorable in all, and the bed in defiled. Another verse which teaches about morality is this. In the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians in verse 7, he says, 
Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, to avoid sexual immorality, which is what that word means, this is the way to do it. Let every man have his own wife and let every woman her own husband. And that, we'll see, is God's definition of marriage. Now, it goes right back to the beginning of Scripture. It goes right back to the creation of the heavens and the earth and the time in which God created Adam from the dust of the ground on day six. And when there was new, no one suitable as a helper for Adam, God put Adam to sleep and created out of his side a woman and gave Adam the woman and we read in Genesis chapter 4 that therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they twain shall be one flesh now there's a consistency isn't there with what we saw in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 and 1 Corinthians 7 verse 2 that there is a man and a woman coming together and it's God's definition of marriage now there's quite a few things in that verse that we might miss if we don't spend a little bit of time thinking a little bit about this this uh, these words it's it's clearly God's definition it goes right back to the beginning he sets out a moral code for us right at the very beginning and involved in that is leaving father and mother and if you leave the home in which you are living with your father and mother you are going to live somewhere else and so there's a change of abode so you're no longer living in the place you were you're living somewhere else and the fact that you have moved from one place to another place is not something that is kept secret it's open it's public and what it does is legitimizes, therefore, the coming together of the man and the woman. It's part of the whole process of marriage that God has defined from the very beginning, that a man and a woman should be together only when there is something as public as this. Today, of course, we have our marriage ceremonies, and that is clear that uh, men and women know that a man and a woman they're going to get married together there's a marriage everybody knows that 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 situation is going to mean that they are joined together for life following this of course it's perfectly permissible for there to be a union of man and woman marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled and including in this by implication is that there is an exclusion of all others now that's way back in Genesis but does it have any relevance today well Jesus endorses this teaching in Matthew 19 and we won't go there but he, and he further expands on the topic but he notes it there in Genesis uh, in Matthew chapter 19 now on this um, this point here, leaving father and mother, change of abode, is a very interesting little uh, section in, in Scripture. I say little because it's the largest of all the chapters in the book of Genesis. It's Genesis chapter 24. And the subject matter of this chapter is Abraham seeking a suitable wife for his son Isaac. And it's incredibly detailed. You go to Genesis chapter 1 and you've got the information about the creation of the earth which is very concise God's told us what he wants us to know about creation he set it out there there it is Genesis chapter 1 but it's only 31 verses and we get a bit more in Genesis chapter 2 when we go to Genesis 24 we've got this massive long chapter of very large verses about a wife for Isaac so that's quite important isn't it it's it's of course has typical significance but the very little bit that I'd like us to note is right at the very end of the chapter a servant of Abraham's goes a long way north and gets a wife and that turns out to be Rebecca and one evening they return 
and it's even tide. And when Rebecca and Isaac are there, it says Isaac's in the field, he's meditating, and the camels come along and Rebecca's on there. What does he do? He puts Rebecca into his mother's tent. He doesn't take her into his own tent. He puts her into his mother's tent. And the implication of that is that there needs to be some public declaration that maybe the next day or maybe a few days later that they will be together as man and wife. It's interesting to, to follow that little bit of tiny bit of detail that the word of God gives us. Now, I think we've probably got a bit of an idea about what God has said about marriage at the present time. What we want to know now is what man thinks. So, let's have a, a look at um, this fellow here. Uh, he's um, Samuel Johnson. You may know that he's famous for writing a dictionary. It's really the first uh, dictionary that, that was uh, of the English language, the first meaningful dictionary of the English language. He comes from uh, Litchfield, and there's the house that he was born in. It's now turned into a bookshop and a little museum, I think. And he put this dictionary uh, together. It took him uh, a little while, and, uh, which, he, which he did in London, and it was published on the 15th of April, 1755. So... It's regarded as the standard work at the, at the time of the English language. A monumental work in two volumes, and it lasted as the standard work of the English language for 173 years until the, uh, it was taken on by the Oxford English Dictionary, which now is the standard for, for the English language. It took seven years for, for this language, uh, for this dictionary to be complete. And so, going back to 1755, perhaps it's useful to know what the dictionary said about marriage. Because this was man's view at the time, wasn't it? As far as the English-speaking world was concerned. So when you look at his dictionary, this is what he says about marriage. It says, the act of uniting a man and woman together according to law. And when you look at the word married, you'll say that it's joined in wedlock. Now there's nothing there to suggest that there's anything untoward or different from what God has said in his word in those verses that we've looked at concerning a man and woman coming together in marriage. Nothing different at all. It's pretty concise. It doesn't go into great detail, but it's not inconsistent with what we find out in the Bible. So we find out that man was quite happy to accept the principles which were contained in the Word of God at that time. Man was very happy to do that. And, and so if anyone was married in a registry office in the United Kingdom, where I come from, you would be able to see uh, this plaque on the wall in every registry office in the United Kingdom. And it says this, marriage according to the law of this country is the union of one man with one woman voluntarily entered into for life to the exclusion of all others. And once again, when we look at this and we look at those passages that we've seen in the, uh, in the Bible, that there is nothing, I, I can't see anything inconsistent at all, anything different from those things that we've considered in God's word. Again, because the uh, laws of this country were based largely on uh, Judeo-Christian teaching, which is contained, of course, in the Bible. And that's what it said on every wall of, U uh, Euro of the registry office, each registry office, in the United Kingdom until, until very recently. And I don't know if it's the case, but I assume it might be that there is a little part of the United Kingdom, which is the province of Northern Ireland, where that definition would still apply in the way that it is set out there. Well, what do you find now? What is the difference now? What has changed now? 
Well, if you take a look now at a dictionary, you'll get a different definition. You won't get the clear linked to scripture definition that was there in Samuel Johnson's dictionary. You won't get that replicated, that, that definition which was originally replicated in the Oxford English Dictionary. You'll get something like this. So I want to highlight a couple of things. So the first definition over here, now you probably can't read that very well, so I'll read it to you. Uh, so number one, first definition, broadly any of the diverse forms of interpersonal union established in various parts of the world to form a familial bond that is recognized legally, religiously, or socially, granting the participation, participation part, partners mutual conjugal rights and the responsibilities and including, for example, opposite sex marriage, same-sex marriage, plural marriage, and arranged marriage. Uh, we won't go any further than that, but you can see that there's a real problem there with what God has said in his word. It differs from what we find in the dictionary that was in existence many years ago and that one which was in existence not that long ago. And, and look at uh, this final one, which you probably can read. Number 11 says uh, obsolete. So one meaning is it obsolete, the formal declaration or contract by which act a man and a woman join in wedlock. Now, what man is saying now is that what God has said in his word, as far as he is concerned, is obsolete. Well, what do you think God thinks about that? What do you think he thinks about people blatantly disregarding the teaching of his word and changing a definition which he has set out very clearly in his word for us to follow. Do you think he's happy with that situation? Do you think he's content? Do you think he's likely to overlook that situation forever? Well, let's just see what has been happening. That definition, or something like it, has been accepted in all those countries in recent times. There has been legislation passed in all of those countries from the time when the Netherlands first passed a law for same-sex so-called marriage in the year 2000. And then you can see the progression through Belgium, Canada, Spain, South Africa, Norway, Sweden, and so on. In England and Wales, it was 2013. In Scotland, it was the following year, but not in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland has remained outside of that legislation and within the province of Northern Ireland the definition of marriage is as we would understand it from the earlier um, definitions that we've considered. It's widespread isn't it? It's widespread. It is increasing from this very beginning here it is increasing um, we can see that since 2009, in this area here, there have been many countries, and most of these countries, of course, are in the Western world, the developed world. Not all, but most of them are. Now, we read together from Genesis chapter 19. I wonder if we could just turn there for a few minutes. Now, Genesis chapter 19 records for us the information that we find concerning the life of, of Lot. And we'll pick up the record in verse 1. Um, the, the background to this is that God saw that there were real, real problems in Sodom and he needed to do something and what he wanted to do was destroy Sodom. But he knew that there was a righteous man living there, a man by the name of Lot, whom the New Testament describes as just or righteous, and the emphasis is placed on the, in the New Testament on his righteousness. But he was vexed, it says, with the filthy conversation or manner of life of the wicked in this place where he lived. 
And God was willing to rescue him from a, a town, a city, which was about to be the recipient of the judgments of God. So he sent two angels, they looked like men, to Sodom at even, Genesis 19, verse 1. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and he rose up to meet them. And Lot extended hospitality to them, not knowing they were angels. And when he, he did that, we find what happens then in verse 4. That the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round about, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And why did they do that? They did that because they wanted these men to come out so that they could engage in immoral practices with them. And these were men, and the angels were in the appearance of men. So as to all intents and purposes, Lot and everybody else in the city of Sodom thought they were men. And men wanted to have these men outside that they could engage in abominable practices with them. That's what they said in verse 5 when they came to Lot's house. At the end of verse 5, bring them out unto us that we may know them. Now, verse 6 tells us something very interesting uh, about the bravery of this man, Lot. He goes outside his house, and outside his house there is a, a mob of men. They're old, some of them, some of them are young. They've come from all over the city, and they're gathering around Lot's house. And he wants to protect these men that are inside his house. So he goes outside to confront this mob this rabble demanding that the men be brought out. And not only that, he closes off his escape route. He shuts the door behind him. He's willing to face them and try to persuade them not to behave in the way that they were behaving. Which he says in verse 7, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Now he offers his daughters, and I believe that what he's doing here is he's actually calling their bluff. And if that's right, he was right, wasn't he? Because they were not interested in his daughters, not at all. And he probably knew that. And then in verse 9, they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn and he, not, he will needs be a judge. And now we will deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. So they were going to tear him apart, break down the door and get what they wanted. That's how mad they were. That's how depraved they were in their wicked lust. Remember, we saw that definition, evil concupiscence, wicked lust. But these men inside Lot's house were actually angels from God. And an angel from God has power beyond the power of man. And through a miracle, they got hold of Lot and they rescued him and brought him back into the house and smote the men outside with blindness so that they were powerless to do anything at all. And this was all to precede the judgment that God was to bring upon this city and, two, and three other cities, Gomorrah, Admar, and Zeboim. Uh, and the rest of the chapter goes on to describe, to describe this. Now I'm going to suggest to you that the behavior of these men in Genesis 19 is very much like the behavior that we find today amongst the minority of the population who are willing to try and move forward their agenda to do what they want to. Not to obey God's moral teaching, but to consider that they have a right to consider morality from their own point of view. And so anything goes. 
The Bible talks quite a bit about this event in Genesis chapter 19. So I'm going to take you to two references now, which I think will be very enlightening when we compare this with the behavior and attitude of many men and women today. It's a minority, but they are a very vocal and active minority. So we're going to look at two references, and they are, first of all, to be found in Isaiah chapter 3. Now, the chapter is dealing with Israel's wickedness. And Isaiah is a prophet from God sent to talk to the people. So, what we find in verse 9 is uh, a verse which, which is dealing with the attitude of the people of Israel, but it's linked to the attitude of the people of Sodom. And this is what it says. It says, The show of their countenance doth witness against them. So this is the people of Israel. What they do, what you see them do, is an absolute witness that they're doing things that are wrong. It's obvious they're doing things that are wrong. And they declare their sin as Sodom. So notice this. They declare their sin as Sodom they hide it not. Now that's interesting. They hide it not. So the people in Sodom were open about their behavior. They didn't care what people thought. They thought they had a right to do what they wanted to. Not to obey God, not to think about his moral teaching, but to do what they considered to be acceptable, what they wanted to, to manifest their wicked lust. Now, isn't it amazing that that verse describes a situation today? What, what is it today? What does coming out mean today? It means that behavior which was, no, which was under, abnormal, which was underground, has now right out in the open. They declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. It is open. Let's turn to another prophet, Ezekiel Chapter 16, actually I have it on the screen so we don't need to turn it up. But again, we're looking at the sins of Israel and Judah. And we're looking at what was said about Sodom. It's linked to Sodom. And so in Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 49 it says this. This was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. So here's a list of some of the sins of Sodom. And the first one in that list is pride. Well, does that ring any bells with the behavior of some people today in their marches that they hold on regular basis, on a regular basis in so many places in the world? And so this world that we live in is becoming very much like Sodom of old. Remember Sodom was a city in which the men and women, the men rather, old and young, came from every quarter. And now we're finding that all over the world there are marches which are called pride marches where they are open about their abominable, according to scripture, behavior. And it's one of the sins for which God said he would destroy the city of Sodom, and he did. not particularly linked with Sodom, is this verse in the letter to the Romans, and in verse 1 and verse 27. So it's very clear this is not uh, a doctrine, a teaching of God which is confined to Old Testament times, but one which is extended into the New Testament. It must be, mustn't it? Because anything other than marriage which is honorable in all and the bed and defiled, must mean that anything other than that is not honorable, is dishonoring God, and the bed is defiled. That's clearly the implication of that passage. So Romans tells us that this is a sin. God regards this as a sin. And likewise also the men burned in their lust, one toward another. Men 
working men with men, working that which is unseemly. Now God is going to not overlook these things. There's a verse in the letter to the Galatians which tells us that God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The God of heaven and earth has set out the standards in his word. He expects men and women to, to obey them. When they disregard his standards, he moves in. And in that hymn that we sang at the beginning, there's a reference to the flood of Noah, which happened a while ago. And the New Testament talks about this in Peter's epistle, his um, second epistle, and at chapter 3. And this epistle, epistle is dealing with the situation of, of judgment. Which Jesus had warned his people that there was to be a judgment that would come. And Peter writes this second epistle. And he warns people about this situation that had developed towards the end of the first century. And he says in verse 3, 2 Peter 3, verse 3, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Well, Whatever has been promised, it's not going to happen. Things are just carried on, haven't they? And Peter says, no, that's not the case. That these people are willingly ignorant. For this they willingly are ignorant of. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. And so God destroyed all the peoples of the earth on account of their wickedness. And the only ones that were saved was Noah, his wife, and his children and their wives. Just eight souls were saved. And God caused the waters of the flood to be receded. And a new beginning occurred on the earth. But clearly it wasn't that long, was it, before problems are, are started to arise. Now, what happened in Sodom is really very significant. It's very significant because of what I'm about to suggest to you now. When God made promises to a man called Abraham, he, made some, he said some wonderful things to him. And the importance of this man Abraham, as far as the Bible is concerned, is clearly revealed by the fact that Abraham is mentioned 70 times in the New Testament. So his name occurs over 70 times in the New Testament. That's a lot. So whatever God said to Abraham is important. And the New Testament expands on many of the things that God said. Now one of the things that God said to Abraham is in Genesis chapter 15. Now we do, we do quickly need to turn this one up. We're coming to the end of our remarks now. But in Genesis chapter 15, we read there, so God is speaking to Abraham, and we're going to see what relevance this has to what is happening in our world today. So in verse 13, this is part of the promises that God made to Abraham. He says, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and shall afflict them four hundred years. And then it says, also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. Now, the nation that they served was Egypt. And we've already been there, haven't we? We talked about that when we looked at Leviticus chapter 18. The nation whom they serve will I judge. And afterward, they shall come out with great substance. Verse 16, but in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So the people, the descendants of Abraham... He was told that they would go into Egypt and they would be there for a, a, a period of time and then they would come out. And, and the implication then is that there would be something that would happen regarding the Amorites. You see right at the end of verse 16, the iniquity 
of the Amorites is not yet full. Now the Amorites were peoples who lived in the very land that Abraham was. And they were iniquitous. But it was going to get worse. Because the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. It was going to become more and more wicked over those years. And at a particular point, God decreed that the Amorites would be destroyed so that Israel could go into the land. But that was 400 years away. Before ever the descendants of Abraham went into Egypt, something happened to some of the Amorites. And who are they? Well, there's the Amorites, the seven nations of Canaan during Joshua's time, whom he was told by God to destroy because of their wickedness, that it had reached a peak. And Sodom and Gomorrah, part of those nations, was destroyed within 20 years. Now let's just think about that. Why was Sodom destroyed before all of these cities? Surely it was because that their behavior, which had deteriorated very, very quickly into that situation that we saw in Genesis chapter 19, it's within 20 years of Genesis chapter 15, God saw fit to bring forward the judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah and Admar and Zeboim because of their wickedness. That's a bit of a warning, isn't it, for the situation today. Man has created a, a world in which some parts of the world are like Sodom and Gomorrah. And God has said he will judge the world. Is that judgment far away? Is the patience of God going to extend for many, many decades before he does something, before he intervenes? The way in which man behaves, I'm pretty sure that that's not going to be the case. And so that's of great interest to us. Now what about the positive side of things? Let's just think about that for a moment. Because when this happens, the earth's not going to be left in chaos. It's not going to be left without governance, without a ruler, without laws, without guidance. It's not going to be left without blessings. It's going to be given blessings. And I'm just going to tell you what those verses say for want of time. We won't turn them up. That in Luke chapter 1, before ever the Lord Jesus Christ was born, his mother Mary was told that she would have a son and he would reign upon the throne of his father David. He would be called the son of the highest and of his kingdom there would be no end. That when he was born, he was put to death by his own people. But because of his righteousness, God raised him from the dead and he was then made known to his disciples who were given a commission to go forth through all the Gentile lands and to preach the gospel. And Acts 1.11 shows the revelation to them when the Lord Jesus Christ, who was with them, was then taken up in a cloud to heaven. And the angel said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And when he does come, those words in Micah chapter 1 and verse 4 will be, I should say actually Micah 4. Um, it's Micah 4 verse 1 to 4. When God says that the Lord's house will be exalted above the top of the mountains and men will flow into it to be educated in divine ways. When, as the prophecy says, men shall turn their spears, plowshares, spears into pruning hooks and their plowshare, um, but I, I can't remember what that is, just off the top of my head. But you know that verse very well. Should have turned it up. But it says, men shall sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree, none making them afraid. This is the, the world that's coming. It's not the world that's now, but it's the world that's coming. When God's moral laws will be again set out in the earth and will be obeyed because a righteous king will be ruling from Jerusalem and the law will go forth from there. This is... The outcrop in Athens, in, uh, known as Mars Hill, 
And looking down on that Ararat outcrop from the Areopagus, right on the top of, of um, sorry, on the, uh, the, uh, from the Parthenon, on the top, you look down on this rock, um, you see this rock known as Mars Hill, and you'll see that uh, the speech of Paul ends up with these words. Because he, that is God, the appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. So I'll just leave you with this, this poster, which is uh, a, a poster that I found by, produced by a, a Christian church, but giving us very, very, very sound advice. And a man should really take account of what God has said, because... If not, that judgment will come very, very swiftly upon the earth. It was God himself who united a man and woman in marriage. Marriage, therefore, is a divine institution, not a human one. And consequently, God, and not man, has the right to define the terms of the institution. If man changes what God has said, he does so at his own peril. Thank you very much for listening.